is my pleasure at this time uh, to introduce our last speaker of this evening. Uh, he will be addressing the topic, Stepping Down Asthma Medi Medicines. It is Dr. Sunil Joshi. Dr. Joshi is a Mayo Clinic alumnus who practices here in Jacksonville, Florida. He is highly respected and has many honors that include being the past president of the Florida Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Society and serving on the board of directors for the Florida chapter of the American Association. He is married. He has two children. He says as soon as he leaves his talk today, he's going down to watch a, a scrimmage of the Jaguars. Yeah. At this time, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sunil Joshi. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for having me um, today. I, I appreciate it, and I, and I think you know asthma is a huge disease uh, process, and of course, as an allergist, that's what we spend most of our time doing. And you guys, as asthma educators, do a great job because we know that educating people about asthma has a lot to do with better outcomes and keeping people out of the hospital. So, appreciate what you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis, and I hope that we'll get something out of this talk. It's a controversial topic, as you know, but I'm willing to um, stop at any time to answer questions, and I'll, I'll kind of, there'll be little breaks during the talk where I might ask if you guys have questions. Um, so first of all, I'm glad a lot of you guys aren't from here, so you may know Jacksonville is a beautiful place. You may figure that out already. We have, and we're one of the few cities in Florida that actually has natural beauty, okay? So we've got a beach, and we have a river going right through the center. Um, but we do have traditions, too, and we have big football games that we have here in town, and, um, and we have a beautiful downtown, and you guys are lucky to be able to stay in downtown right now as well. Um, so we'll start from the beginning here. So the whole idea is, is wanting to step down asthma medications. Well, I think it's important for us to just remember what exactly asthma is. We all know that asthma is a chronic disease of the airways, and it's very variable. And so variable is an important word for us to remember because it's very hard for us to pigeonhole an asthmatic because everything kind of changes be between each patient that has asthma. So it's a variable condition in which environmental factors play a role as do uh, genetic factors, as you guys all know. Remodeling, which is the process of the damage that occurs um, in people with uh, asthmatic inflammation, typically does improve with inhaled corticosteroids, but after we stop inhaled corticosteroids, the remodeling occurs again. So it's not like the inhaled steroids get rid of the problem, and that's why, thus the question, when do you step down? Okay, so inhaled steroids are not disease modifying. They do not get rid of the process. So why do we even consider stepping down then? If we know that asthma is an ongoing inflammatory disease, why do we even think about backing off on medications? Well, there are plenty of reasons to. One is, of course, there are some adverse effects of inhaled steroids or, of course, systemic steroids as well, including the potential for growth suppression in children, um, that risk of pneumonia with some of our inhaled corticosteroids that you know about, black box warnings and our combination drugs uh, in particular, and then, of course, the oral candidiasis, the hoarseness, some of these things that we know happen in patients with uh, asthma who are using inhaled steroids. Also, patients want to avoid medicines, too. So, I mean, it's like, number one, we understand that it's a chronic process that has remodeling and we need to treat the inflammation um, and that we're trying to minimize adverse effects. But when you're sitting there talking to the patient, the patient also typically doesn't want to be on a medicine. So, we always want to take the patient's preference into consideration with whatever we do in medicine, obviously. Um, the patient burden, whether it's time and technique, you know, a lot, of, a lot of our high school students don't have that, the five seconds to do the inhaler correctly, right? So they're so busy. And then quality of life, if you look at quality of life studies, people typically rate their quality of life higher when they're on less medications, okay? So you automatically feel like you're doing poorly when you're taking a medication. So another reason that we like to back down on medicines, of course, is the cost. Medicines aren't cheap, and asthma medicines in particular are very pricey. Um, inhaled steroids or combination drugs can be very expensive, and that in itself is a source of stress for patients. Um, costs, unfortunately, are trending up. Uh, we don't have a generic yet for, for uh, an inhaled corticosteroid or for a combination drug. Um, and then the, so the bi financial benefits of stopping are theoretical, but certainly those of you who spend a lot of money on your own medicines know that they are real benefits to, to backing off on medicines. 
Simplification, so as you back down on meds, it could become a little bit easier to um, increase adherence and compliance, especially if you go from twice a day to just once a day with your asthma medicine. And I'm sorry I'm walking back and forth. It's just a very long room, and I want to make sure I give everybody attention here. Okay. Um, the other big one is on-demand dosing. So that's another thing we'll talk about here as well. As you know, a lot of people know that inhaled corticosteroids are meant to be used every day. They're preventative medicines. And some of our patients on their own will just use it when they need to for flare-ups. And there actually are studies looking at that as to whether it's any different than using inhaled steroids alone. And we'll talk about that. So many benefits may certainly exist when stepping down. However, none of them are well studied. So we don't really know 100% for sure whether those benefits that we just talked about uh, do indeed exist. So you have to balance all of this with the risk of asthma exacerbations and the risk of side effects from the drugs themselves. Okay, there, there are reasons not to step down as well. Um, don't forget that when you step down, you're always worried about exacerbation. So if your patient is doing really well and, and they're stable, why step down if you're, if you're concerned they're gonna have an exacerbation? Again, some of those reasons to step down as we talked about before are, are certainly genuine reasons, but we are definitely concerned about patients having exacerbations of their asthma if we step down. And why is that important? Because when they have an exacerbation of their asthma, they go to the emergency room or the hospital, they get admitted, and that certainly is not good. Other disease processes that are, have chronic inflammation, like rheumatoid arthritis, for instance, <laughs> if you back off on the anti-inflammatories, they don't go to the hospital immediately, right? There are other ways to manage them, whereas in these situations, it could be difficult. And then, of course, loss of control. So they end up using their rescue inhaler more frequently. So we all know that asthma is an inflammatory disease. Each person, I like this slide because it talks about an individual. Asthma is not just a disease that fits in a box. It really doesn't. There's so Each asthmatic that I see on a day-to-day -day basis is different than the next one I'm going to see. And you guys all know that as well. So there's so much that goes into it, including the genetic predisposition, um, allergies for sure, and environmental triggers stress, all those things can flare up asthma. But the part that we worry about the most and what we talk about, what we're talking about today, is the inflammatory component of asthma, which is what leads to the prolonged um, exacerbations and the fixed airway obstruction that, that we try to minimize. And so that inflammation is what leads to symptoms, airway obstruction, bronchial hyperresponsiveness, and airway remodeling. So we're always targeting inflammation. And there's some People who believe even mild intermittent asthmatics should be on inhaled steroids because they have ongoing inflammation. <clears throat> so I put some of these slides in, not to bore you, but just to kind of give you an idea as to how intricate the immune system is. Um, and so just so you know, like when you look at the allergic component of an asthma exacerbation, uh, I think it's important to know that if somebody is exposed to, let's say, dust mites or oak tree pollen or something that comes in to the tissue, we have a, a B cell that presents it to a T cell. I know that's getting a little technical, but it, this is important because these are the cells, the T cells that drive inflammation. So they force the B cell to produce an antibody called IgE, the allergy antibody. And this IgE antibody sits on allergy cells, which are mast cells, um, eosinophils, macrophages, and basophils, all these different cells. And that's what gets excited when an allergen now comes into the system. So if you're exposed to dust mites, Again, and you've already got these cells primed with IgE antibody, these cells then release their preformed mediators, which include things like histamine and leukotrienes and uh, cytokines that are involved in the inflammatory process. And so as it releases those things, the first thing you get is bronchospasm and coughing and wheezing, and that's the early response of, the early allergic response that people get uh, with asthma. And so that's typically because of things like histamine and leukotrienes that are released. But then this, these cytokines are also released, and that's what leads to the late phase of the allergic reaction, which is a chronic inflammation, the chronic coughing, the chronic wheezing, the bronchitis that may develop in somebody with asthma, and in somebody with chronic sinusitis or with, with allergic rhinitis can lead to chronic sinusitis. Okay, so it's, what we do when we treat with steroids is we're treating the late phase of the reaction, not the early phase, the late phase, and that's the late phase that causes all of the damage that we talk about with asthma. So this next slide talks about what happens next. So here, you know, we have cytokines that are released, and one couple of cytokines that are important are this IL-4, IL-13, and one called IL-5. And why is it important for you to know that? So there's a lot of drugs coming out that treat these cytokines to try to help asthmatics. Okay, so IL-5 is very important because it, it stimulates growth of um, eosinophils, which are the ultimate allergy cell in the bone marrow. 
And then that, those cells come out of the bone marrow into the bloodstream, and because of that same cytokine, they bind to the blood vessel and then come into the airway, okay? So that's important because if you block IL-5, you might block those allergy cells from getting into the airway, which cause the damage. But these allergy cells come into the airway and they release, scar, they, they release little uh, mediators that lead to scar tissue inside of the lungs. And it's the scar tissue inside the lungs that makes it very difficult for an asthmatic who has had asthma for years and has not been treated with steroids because they start to get fixed airway obstruction. And that's what we would try to avoid. And so what, do you know what, what drugs really treat eosinophils? If you treat an eosinophil with this drug, it disappears. You know it because you see it all the time in the hospital when they get sick. Steroids. So you put them on prednisone, you put them on inhaled steroid, and these go away. And so that's why we use inhaled steroids to treat asthmatics because, again, the eosinophils are the, are the cells that do the damage. This is why we don't treat them with antihistamines because the histamine is not what's causing the long-term damage inside of the airway, it's the eosinophil. And so if you put eosinophils in a vat with steroids, the eosinophils go away. And so inhaled steroids getting into the lung suppresses this part of the immune system. Okay, so I like this slide because it shows what a normal lung looks like and it shows what an asthmatic lung looks like. And so, so this normal piece of lung is what we call pseudostratified columnar epithelium, um, ciliated columnar epithelium with goblet cells. Okay, and that's normal for the airway. And then you have a very, very small muscular area, and then you have some uh, fibrous areas around here where the blood vessels are. This is an asthmatic. And anyone want to take a shot at what kind of asthmatic? Are we looking at mild intermittent, mild persistent, moderate persistent, or severe persistent asthma that would look like this? Any idea? Okay, severe persistent. This is a mild persistent asthmatic. Okay, somebody who has symptoms maybe three times a week and uses their rescue inhaler about three times a week and has mild persistent asthma. So what you're seeing here is the epithelial lining is all gone. Okay, I'll come over here so you guys can see what I'm talking about. So the epithelial lining is, that was here in a normal uh, patient is no longer there. The muscular layer is much, much bigger. Look at all those goblet cells. Okay, way here at the bottom right of the screen are goblet cells, okay? And so there's a whole group of mu mucus producing cells here as well that are gonna produce mucus fill up the airway, and we don't have the ciliated epithelium. The cilia on the epithelium is important because it pushes all the mucus out. If that cilia is not there, then, and you're producing all of this mucus, you have airway obstruction, okay? And if you completely block off your airways, you have you know, a significant difficulty in oxygenating your airway, your um, bloodstream. And so that's somebody with mild persistent asthma, somebody who uses their inhaler three times a week, okay? And so that's why we use inhaled steroids or um, anti-inflammatories to treat these folks, so it goes back to that. And that's another reason why we don't like when we hear they're using their inhaler more than two times a week outside of exertion, because we know what the pathology looks like, and, and we want to try to stop that. So, stepping down medications, okay, from a combination drug to an ICS alone. So, you know, we'll start kind of at the higher level of the uh, asthma, um, you know, step care uh, treatment plan. And so combination drugs such as Advair or Dulera or Simbicort or Brio or some of those are the ones that are kind of up there on that combination list. What if we took away the combination and just put them on the ICS alone? Well, there are five randomized placebo-controlled studies. Okay, so you can look at studies and you can find a lot of things in the literature, but typically you don't want to base any decisions on anything that's not randomized, double-blind, and placebo-controlled. Okay, and so that's what we're looking at here. And these were in, in children from 15 years in, in adults over the age of 18. Um, a lead-in period in which their asthma was completely stable for up to two months, to, um, depending on the study. And they would step down from a combination drug to an inhaled steroid using the same dose of ICS that was in the combination drug, but just taking away the LAVA, the long-acting beta agonist. And the measure, measured outcomes were emergency room visits, hospitalizations, use, for, use of systemic steroids, and acute illness visits to the, to the doctor's office. And so the outcomes basically showed that there was a 2.4 um, relative risk, 2.4 times more likely for the patient who stepped down to an ICS alone to go to the emergency room. A 2.24 times more likely to have an acute office visit for asthma, and 1.68 more likely to have to use systemic steroids. Okay, so that makes it look like, my gosh, that was a horrible idea, okay? But when you look at statistics, you have to look, in this case, when you're looking at relative risk, you have to look at what they call a confidence interval, okay? 
95% confidence interval. And when you're doing relative risk, that means the relative risk of one means that it's equal. You know, you're equally likely to do well in this group as opposed to that group. When the relative risk goes above one, then you're uh, more likely to, in this case relative risk, more likely to do poorly in the second group than in the first group. So when the confidence interval goes past one, you have here 0.79 all the way up to 6.35, that means there's some people in the group who did better and there's some people who did worse. And so when you see a 95% confidence interval that includes the number one in the middle, then that's not statistically significant. So even though 2.24, you're 2.24 times more likely to go to the emergency room, if you step down, it still cannot be said with enough confidence to say it's statistically significant. And the same thing was true for use of systemic steroids and office visits. So both of those, all three of those, the value passed one. So it means that though it is a trend towards it being um, more likely to lead to exacerbations, it wasn't conclusive, unfortunately. But there were no deaths, no ICU admissions, no mechanical ventilation or hospitalization. So yes, there's an increased risk of exacerbations potentially, but not any bad outcomes by doing that. So the trend is to have slightly worse asthma control and quality of life when you go from a combination drug to an ICS. Okay. So stepping, the risk of stepping down from a combination drug to an ICS alone, again, is not completely clear. It looks like there's an increased risk, okay, but, but all of the confidence intervals passed one, so statistically, Maybe it's not a, such an increased risk. Um, and when people did have trouble, they did not end up with ICU admission, hospitalizations, or mechanical ventilation. Okay, so they may have an increase in symptoms, but you still were keeping them out of the hospital. Any questions about going from combination drugs to ICS alone before we go on? I know it's Friday, and it's, you guys want to get out to the beach. I showed you the pictures and all that good stuff. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so what about an inhaled steroid to a lower dose inhaled steroid, right? Because that's another thing that we do all the time. And believe it or not, there's only really, whoops, there's only really good, of good four randomized controlled studies looking at this. We don't really look at this too often. So looking at children and adults, um, they had to have stable symptoms from anywhere between one month to a whole year before they were able to randomize into this study. Again, the relative risk in those with a 50% reduction in ICS dose, which is typically how we reduce ICS is by going down by 50%, um, was 1.25 for an asthma exacerbation. The relative risk in those who step down to on-demand ICS, which means they stopped their ICS completely and only used it when they started having symptoms, was 1.28, okay? So if you just look at those two things, if you stayed on an ICS, but just cut the dose by 50%, your risk was the same as somebody who completely came off of an ICS and only used it as soon as they started having symptoms, okay? Um, about the same, but again, remember both of these, the confidence interval, so would you consider this to be um, statistically significant, either one of those? No. no, because it's getting closer because the lower end of it is very close to one, but it still does cross one. So you've got one below one and then above one, so it's not significant, but, so, but if you, Old, you know, if you extrapolate data, it looks like the group that was on the 50% reduction versus the group that stepped down to on-demand, they did about the same. You know, the two of them did the same. Um, and so again, when they talk about on-demand, they're talking about as soon as you get a head cold starting on an ICS for two weeks, or if you're using your rescue inhaler more than twice a day. Okay, so the risk of an exacerbation is not different in those who remained on the stable dose of the ICS um, and reducing the dose can increase compliance, you know, in once a day dosing. So again, there wasn't a big difference between somebody stopping the medicine or somebody just cutting the dose by 50% in these studies. Okay, and then what about an inhaled steroid to leukotriene inhibitor? Is this, you know, this is a common thing. Those of us who see children, you know, parents want to get off of the inhaled steroid, and so we're looking at leukotriene inhibitor, which we know can help in asthmatics. And that may be, you know, an option for them. So this particular study had over 300 patients, a six-week stability period before they're able to enter in the study. And the relative risk was about a 1.5, uh, you're 1.5 times more likely to have an exacerbation if you went into the leukotriene group. And that group, which I don't have the confidence interval on here, was statistically significant. Okay, so in that particular uh, instance, if you're decreasing from an ICS to a leukotriene inhibitor, 
the chances of having an exacerbation are 1.5 times greater, and that is a clinically relevant difference based on statistics. Okay. But what do leukotrienes do, and why do we use them in asthma? Um, just remember that cystinyl leukotrienes do a lot of things, um, and inhaled steroids do not block cystinyl leukotrienes. Okay. So that's why you know, Singulair and um, the other one, which is Acolate, you know, those and Zyl Zylutin, those drugs can, are still popular in asthmatics because inhaled steroids block almost everything in the allergic cascade, everything in the asthmatic cascade except for leukotrienes. And leukotrienes cause blood vessels to swell. And when blood vessels swell, they get edematous and they release fluid. So it makes, makes you have fluid in the airway. They also cause an increase in goblet cells, which increase mucus secretion into the airway. And we also talked about how damaging the mucus secretion can be in asthmatics. They also allow for eosinophils, those allergy cells, to get into the airway. Um, there are plenty of studies that suggest that um, cystinyl leukotrienes, leukotriene L4 in particular, allows these eosinophils to come into the airway, what they call them chemotactic for um, eosinophils, which are the allergy cells that we worry about. And remember, those eosinophils cause damage in the airway. They decrease that epithelial lining, you have less of the cilia, and they increase the goblet cells. So number one, we are causing more edema into the airway, we're causing more mucus production, and we're damaging the lining, all with cystinyl leukotrienes. They also can cause a smooth muscle to constrict and proliferate. So you're getting a lot of inflammation just because of leukotrienes, so thus things like Singulair and Accolade can definitely be helpful at treating asthmatics. Okay, but how does it compare to an inhaled steroid? You know, so, and that's the debate that we have all the time. You know, again, when you treat children, um, parents are really reluctant to go on the ICS. They're a little bit more likely to take the Singulair knowing that it's not a steroid. But which is better? Is fluticasone better or is Singulair better? Well, here in this study, you're looking at percent change in albuterol use on the um, y-axis. And so the lower you go here, the better. And at the bottom, um, the triangles are for ticazone and the squares are for Montelukast. And the improvement or the um, decrease in albuterol use is significantly better all the way through for 24 weeks in the fluticasone group versus the Montelukast group. So all the way through, if you had them on both, on one or the other, the group that was on the inhaled steroid had less use of their albuterol. Okay. What about change in symptom score? So they don't, they're not using the rescue inhaler, but what about symptoms? Sometimes there's a discordance there. Again, the lower you go on the scale, the better. So um, the triangle group is fluticasone, the square group is Montelukast. So th the group that was on the inhaled steroid had significantly um, more uh, improvement in symptom scores, <laughs> decrease in symptom scores compared to the Montelukast group. So the steroids, again, better all the way through 24 weeks. What about change in FEV1? So we had albuterol use, symptom scores, and FEV1. Um, the, so this time on the y-axis, going up on the y-axis is better. And again, significantly different for the entire 24 weeks on the inhaled steroid versus the Montelukka. So no doubt it's better than placebo, but when you're only blocking one thing, you're not doing as well as if you're blocking um, most things. Morning FEV1 and morning peak flow. Again, the morning, those early, early morning hours, between 5 and 10 o'clock in the morning, is when asthmatics have their worst exacerbation. So you really want to get a feel for what their FEV1 is, what their peak flow is in the early morning hours. And that group, again, that's, uh, and so placebo, here, singular versus placebo. How does singular work? It is definitely better than placebo for morning um, FEV1 and for morning peak flow. So it's not that it doesn't work. It does work. It just doesn't work as well as uh, the steroids do. Okay. So, stepping down from an inhaled steroid to leukotriene inhibitor, well, in this case, there definitely is an increased risk of exacerbation when you do so. Um, so you have to be careful when you're moving down from an inhaled steroid to a leukotriene. Leukotriene inhibitors are better than nothing, but there still is about a 50% chance that they can have um, an increase in their asthma symptoms, okay, when they do that. Any questions about leukotriene inhibitors? Yes, did you have one? No. No, okay. So, I mean, a, a question, a very intuitive question that comes up sometimes when I do talks like this is if inhaled steroids block everything except for what leukotriene inhibitors do, and leukotriene inhibitors do cause inflammation, um, wouldn't you do better if you're on an inhaled steroid and a leukotriene inhibitor together since they both block? And I don't have that data in here because we're talking about stepping down medications, but the answer to that is definitely yes, okay? There are studies looking at 
budesonide and montelukast together versus budesonide and montelukast alone. And the combination of those two drugs works exceptionally well at, um, and it works almost as well as, as a combination drug of an inhaled steroid and a lava at preventing exacerbations um, and improving FEV1. So that's an option to not forget about. What about going from an ICS to no ICS at all? Okay, so there's seven studies, uh, children and adults, um, they had to be stable for about three months, and then they followed them up for half the year, a little bit over half of a year. Again, the relative risk of an asthma exacerbation in a case where you go from an inhaled steroid to no inhaled steroid, remember these people were stable for three months, okay? Three months with no symptoms uh, or very stable asthma, um, and they took them off completely. 2.35 relative risk, 2.35 times more likely to have an exacerbation if you came off of the steroid. There's a, so there's a 16% chance of an exacerbation in that study if they stayed on the stable dose of ICS, um, and a 38% risk if they came off of the ICS. And now tell me, do you think this is a statistically significant study? Yes, because the confidence interval doesn't cross one. The confidence interval starts at 1.88 and goes up to 2.91. So coming off of inhaled steroids is certainly an increased risk. It puts the patient at an increased risk of having an asthma exacerbation, um, even if they're stable for three months like they were in this study. So that's why, you know, we as allergists and asthma specialists, you know, it's very slow sometimes for us to come off of the asthma medicines and, and our patients, and in particular our parents of patients, get very frustrated when they hear our advice, but this is why we know there's a significantly increased risk of having that exacerbation. But everybody wants to come off of meds, so we try it occasionally, um, but there is that risk for sure. So summary of some of the big, um, some of the big things here. Um, so going from an inhaled combination drug, inhaled steroid and lava, to an ICS alone, a 1.68 times. So, and just so you know, when you look at relative risk, okay, so, you know, the number one means that it's equal. If it's 1.01, .01, then you are one, there's a 1% chance, 1% higher chance that you're going to have an exacerbation. If it's 1.68, there's a 68% chance that you would have an exacerbation. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. And so in this one, it crossed one, so it's really unclear, but the trend is certainly towards um, the fact that you would be more likely to have an exacerbation. If you go from an ICS to a reduced dose ICS, um, it's about a 1.25 chance, so there's a 25% chance that you would have an exacerbation over the next year. Um, again, not significant statistically, but getting closer to it, and the trend is definitely towards it. If you go from an ICS to no ICS, there's a 2.35 um, time chance, which means there's a hundred and you're 135 percent more likely to have an exacerbation, um, and that's statistically significant if you go from an ICS to no ICS. So the trend was that as you continue to come off of, of anti-inflammatories, the risk of having an exacerbation became more and more significant. Um, from lavas to ICS, from ICS to less ICS to ICS to nothing we finally became significant there. So it does tell you, kind of goes along with the whole idea of remodeling and how important it is to decrease the inflammation inside of the airway. Okay, so it's always a balancing act for all of us when we're treating asthma in terms of what do we do to try to keep people healthy. Um, you know, it's this nice little balance here where you're worried about asthma exacerbations and loss of controls, but then you also want to avoid the side effects of the drugs, decrease the cost to the patient, not just to the patient, to the system, right? Insurance companies paying for the medicine, which affects all of us with premiums. And um, so the medication cost doesn't just affect your copay, it affects everything that's involved with healthcare. Um, decrease the treatment burden overall in the patient. And that's typically the patient and family's preference. So you're balancing all of that to try to do what you think is in the best interest of your patient. Okay, so any questions about that? Do you guys ever, you know, do you ever wonder, like when a patient or a family member tells you, gosh, I'm just worried about the steroid. You know, I'm taking this inhaled steroid. I'm just worried about taking a steroid every day. Um, do you ever have an answer for them? Do you ever, what do you tell them if they tell you, I just don't, it's a steroid? I'm not going to take a steroid. I'll just do my albuterol. I'll just do my albuterol. Do you have any set lines? I know you all deal with that. Anything that you might tell them? I know it's Friday. I know it's 4 o'clock, almost 5 o'clock. <laughs> nobody wants to talk. Okay. So how to step down asthma medicines? Again, you know, you know after going through this data that there really is no right answer to this, okay? 
So, you know, we, we talk about it. I've looked at review articles. And I was telling somebody earlier that if you took my partners, the four of us in a room, and we said, OK, today we're going to come up with a plan of how we step down all of our asthma medicines, I would probably be dead before I left the room. And we would be arguing so much that it just wouldn't go very well. Um, so, because there is no real right answer to that. So, what we typically do, and what the whoops, and what the guidelines suggest that we do, um, you know, our American Academy of Allergy, Asthma Immunology has some guidelines. And what we do is we start off with a 25 to 50 percent reduction. And remember that one study that said we reduced ICS by 50 percent. They, it was not statistically significant in terms of their risk of exacerbations, but it was approaching it. So that's what we start with a 25 to 50 percent dose reduction. And then you keep going until you get onto a low dose of ICS. So low dose of ICS, Flovin 44 micrograms, one puff twice a day. QVAR 40 micrograms, one puff twice a day. Those are what we would consider low dose ICS. Once you get down to a low dose ICS, then all bets are off and then it becomes very tricky as to whether you stop them and see what happens because the data suggests when you go from ICS to nothing, you're 135% more likely to have an exacerbation. At that point, so if you are reducing to a low dose ICS and they're on a combination drug, that would be a great time to then remove the long acting beta agonist. So they start at Advair 250 or Advair 500, okay? You got them all the way down to Advair 100 and they're doing great. Well, this would be the time to get rid of the Advair and just put them on the flutigazone or the QVAR or the inhaled pulmicord or whatever your inhaled steroid of choice is at that time um, at the same dose but not with the bronchodilator and see what happens. That would also be the time to potentially stop the leukotriene inhibitor if they're on one as well. So you get them on the lowest dose, the, what we call low dose ICS, and then you pull away all the peripheral stuff from that point on. Because you know what you worry about, what patients are worried about is the ICS dose. They're worried about the steroid. So you keep making them happy by reducing the steroid dose until you get to a low enough dose that you know the data. Okay, now I'm a little worried. I'm at that 135% chance of exacerbation if I go any lower. So you pull away the other drugs then at that point. And then when reducing ICS dose, if you can go to once a day, that certainly can in, in, improve compliance. There is not really a lot of data about that either, but just anecdotally it really does help. Okay, so what about going down to on-demand use of an ICS alone? So you can do that too. Remember we saw the one study where there's no difference between going cutting the dose by 50% or just stopping it completely um, and, and using it as soon as you had a flare-up. So pay, it's, and this is considered patient-directed um, use in mild persistent asthma. So off of the ICS or, off, or on a low-dose ICS until you develop a head cold. Okay? So if the patient develops a head cold or if they're using their short-acting beta agonist more than twice a week, which of course means that they're having an exacerbation, then you start on an ICS. You can also adjust it based on things like nitric oxide, which are things that are done in the medical practice. And then if it goes up, put them back on the ICS. And they have similar outcomes to patients who take an ICS on a regular basis. So if we can get down to the low dose of an ICS in our pediatric patients or even our adult patients who want to come off of the ICS, then you could say, okay, you know what? You've done so well for these three months. I'm going to go ahead and stop it. But if you get a head cold, you go back on two puffs twice a day. Or if you're using that rescue inhaler more than twice a week, you go back on two puffs twice a day and you call me. You know? And if they follow the regimen like they do in the studies, you know, because you know, unfortunately studies are not like real life, but if they do follow those recommendations, they should do just as well as they did on the ICS alone. Okay? So, so if you have a good um, compliant patient who's really willing to decrease their medications and wants to do the right thing, then that can work. And we do that in quite a few of our patients as well. So then what do you do? How do you follow them up? Okay, so now you've reduced their ICS, you took away their gatrian, you took away their LABA, and now what are we going to do about them? We see them back in a year, or do we see them back sooner? I mean, we typically want to see them back relatively quickly. So first of all, if somebody's having an exacerbation and I put them on prednisone, or I stepped up their ICS, I want to see them back pretty quickly. So I typically try to see them within two to six weeks. And of course, it's, sometimes it's hard to get into the office, but if they can see anybody in our office within two to six weeks, I'm happy because then we can do a breathing test and make sure that they're truly doing well. No consensus, however, on how to follow up a stable asthmatic. When do you follow them up? Again, allergists don't agree on a lot of things, and so we don't know. But, but what we can tell you is that it's somewhere between three and six months is very reasonable. So, 
If somebody's doing well, they come in to see you, they're doing great, they're not using the rescue inhaler, they're on QVAR, 80 micrograms, one puff twice a day, and they're very happy, you could see them back in six months and then reassess and decide what you want to do, or you could see them in three months. But somewhere between that three and six month time period is reasonable. If you see them too soon, then it's almost like why you keep seeing the person, you know, that's also adding a burden to the patient, uh, decreasing compliance potentially, and also increasing cost of healthcare. Um, having an asthma action plan, um, you know, once they have an increase in symptoms so they can start on that can be helpful, but again, that also has not been studied appropriately, and there is some conflicting data, but we use them in our practice. As soon as the person gets a head cold, or if they've had to use their ICS more than twice a week, they start on the asthma action plan if, if they're following instructions, of course. So what's controversial? Well, the whole thing is controversial, but, but um, so number one, why fix what isn't broken, right? If somebody's taking Zocor for their cholesterol and their LDL is 85 and they're doing great, they're running marathons, why would you stop their Zocor? They're doing great and they weren't before they went on the Zocor. Or if their blood pressure is under control, why would you stop it? And, and most of the time they stay on those. But for some reason with asthma, we really feel like we need to back off on their medicines. And, and again, it's because of the steroid and some, a lot of the stigma associated with that. Um, the risk um, estimates are not completely clear as to what happens if we back down. And how to follow up is also not very clear. Um, everything is just based on consensus. Doing things like exhaled nitric oxide and spirometry can be very, very helpful at managing an asthmatic. Because remember, they're not always, not only are they not compliant, they're also not honest with us a lot of times. So we'll have people come in and say, I'm doing great, doc, I'm fantastic. And they've been using the rescue inhaler, you know, 50 times in the last three weeks. And so they're not doing great. And so you do want to have some objective uh, data. And that's where the exhaled nitric oxide can be very, very helpful. So can spirometry. And so could just a simple thing like the ACT scores. So an ACT scores asks them the five questions that we ask them when we go in to see them. But they actually get to think about it because it's on a, on a little sheet. We give it to them before they even come into the office, you know, into the back office and they have a few minutes to think about each question, and they may think that their asthma is great, and their ACT score, which, you know, 20 and, 19 and above, 20 and above is really considered good, and they'll come with ACT score of 16. And they're like, well, you said you're great, but your ACT is 16. Well, yeah, I have to use it before I go to sleep, and I have to use it in the middle of the night, and I have to use my rescue inhaler uh, anytime I walk my dog, but I'm doing great, doc. And so, um, you know, you realize that they're not doing as well as they are. And then, of course, patient preferences. Um, you know, and how that leads to compliance. These are all controversial issues. So conclu in conclusion here, um, you know, consider stepping down an asthmatic when they are well controlled. So if they have been well controlled for at least three months, I prefer six months, but if they're well controlled, only then would you consider stepping down, okay? If they're using the rescue inhaler, the ACT score is 19 or less, then I would definitely not step down. If their lung function is also stable at that time, and it doesn't necessarily have to be normal, but if it's normal for that patient and their, their symptoms are controlled, the lung function is stable, their biomarkers like exhaled nitric oxide are normal, then you really are in a good position to back down of their medications. Um, the age of, pa of the patient is important as well. Like the young, younger children, again, it becomes a little bit trickier because the historian is the parent, and the parent doesn't, isn't in the body of the child, so the parent may talk about symptoms, but doesn't always know what the child is going through. And, and a lot of times they want to minimize their symptoms because they want to get them off of the medications. And so the age of the patient does play a role into whether or not I back off of medicines. If I have a 75-year-old, 80-year-old patient who's doing great on Symbicort, I'm not going to take them off of Symbicort now. They're going to probably be on that the rest of their lives. I, I'm not even going to play with that 135% chance of them having an exacerbation, right? Because um, the risk isn't as good, the reward isn't as good as the risk is in that situation. Um, time of the year, we were talking about this with a few people earlier. If you live in Northeast Florida, you typically don't back off of asthma medicines in March, April, and May because we have such a bad pollen season. If you live in Chicago, you don't back off of asthma medicines in October, November, or December because you're going to freeze to death outside and, and it's going to make your asthma worse. So the patient's personal history, where you are, everything that's involved, um, must be taken into account, which is what makes it so hard to do studies on asthmatics because each patient is different. So patient and family preferences obviously are always involved there. So I, you know, what I typically do is step, when I'm stepping down 25 to 50% until I get to a low dose ICS, 
And then I might step away from some of the other medicines, whether it's Singular or Accolade or the long-acting beta agonist. And then always have a plan for follow-up. Again, they're not always compliant. They don't always show up. But you want to give them a plan to come back so that you can really help them manage their chronic disease. Any questions for me on this? There's a question over here. Yes. What are your thoughts on taking a break, like a holiday? So we have a lot of pediatricians who stop them in the summer and yep. start their meds again in the winter. Yep, and so do allergists as well. Okay, so taking a break, also controversial. Okay, but, <laughs> but um, I do, I can, you know, being a parent, you know, I can understand where they're coming from. And certainly is there a time of the year for that particular patient where he or she may not need an ICS? Sure, and so if I am gonna give somebody a holiday, I typically do it in the summertime. Um, the, the data, you know, I showed the pictures of the persistent asthmatic who had the poor looking lungs and the normal person who had normal lungs. So when you're on an inhaled steroid, you can push the person back into normal appearing lungs, okay, while you're on the ICS. There is good data to suggest when you come off of the ICS, it takes about three months for the remodeling to start to come back into effect. So if somebody only has a 10 week summer vacation like they do here in Florida, I can stop their ICS on Memorial Day and tell them that you need to start it right back up a week before school starts in middle of August and they're not even at that three month mark and we're probably preventing them from having that, that issue that, that comes up. And so yeah, I'm inf yes, inflammation takes no vacation is what you know, some allergists will say, um, but also you wanna work with the patient and if there is a time of the year where you feel like they're gonna do well, they're very stable, absolutely you can give them a vacation. But keep in mind after three months, the inflammation starts to come back. So you want to give them a vacation, but then have them go back to work too. Okay, any other questions? Oh, yes. I'm Hold sorry, is there back. one over here? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> exercise induced <laughs> asthma. Um, are there any data out there that shows the effectiveness of starting an ICS once the um, symptom starts? Um, is the dose um, strong enough effectiveness to prevent okay. that? Okay, so once they start having more asthma symptoms, meaning coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, and all of that, yeah, so it depends on what we're talking about. So if we're talking about head cold induced asthma, the data suggests that if you wait until they develop symptoms after a head cold, it's too late, okay? If you start the symptoms, as soon, uh, start the um, ICS as soon as they have symptoms of a head cold, then yes, it can be helpful. But if you wait for it to get into their chest, it's too late. If they're doing stable, everything is going great, they haven't used a rescue inhaler in months at a time, they're off their ICS, and suddenly they're needing to use their rescue inhaler. If, if they only need to use the rescue inhaler once in the week, going in the ICS doesn't really make much of a difference because they were probably fine without the ICS. If they have to use it more than twice a week, then starting on the ICS at a medium to high dose for two weeks definitely can decrease their need for oral steroids, okay? But if they're already knee deep in an exacerbation and now they're on day four or five, they've been using their ICS every day and they're coughing and wheezing, at that point it's too late to go to the ICS. Probably like spinning in the wind at that point, okay? Any other questions? Yes. This, this is a physiology question, okay. and, wow. and what I'm wondering is, at what point does the inflammatory process start? I've heard a couple things, as soon as a patient's triggered, inflammation starts, and then I've heard that um, when the patient's triggered, the inflammation starts, which causes the bronchoconstriction. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I've heard that as soon as they're triggered, the constriction starts, the inflammation is a late process. So if a patient is triggered, they take their albuterol, and they never reach the late phase, what stopped the inflammatory process if that's what starts the constriction? Yeah, so, so in asthmatics, we believe that inflammation is there all the time, okay? They have baseline inflammation. <clears throat> Remember, the mild persistent asthmatic is a completely, um, you know, destructured airway. So there's a baseline of inflammation, whether it's eosinophils or T cells or B cells, there's a baseline of inflammation there. 
in all asthmatics. That goes back to the exercise-induced question. You know, if you put them on high doses of inhaled steroid, then they won't need their rescue inhaler when they exercise. Okay, but these are people who have lung functions that are 130, 135% of predicted. They have inflammation in their lungs to begin with. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory disease. There's, as, there's inflammation there all the time. It's like a smoldering forest fire. Okay, this is how I explain it to the because there's a smoldering forest fire. And then it doesn't bother anybody, it's there, but then you get a virus, and the virus is like throwing gasoline on the forest fire. So you had inflammation, now the virus comes along, now you have more inflammation inside there, and that's what then causes the symptoms. And so, so there's baseline inflammation, but that inflammation gets worse on and off. It gets worse with allergy exposure, it gets worse with a virus, it gets worse with cigarette smoke, irritants, diesel exhaust fume, all those things that exacerbate asthma will make the inflammation worse inside of the airways. Why, when you use a rescue inhaler, does it prevent the late phase reaction? Late, uh, rescue inhalers do not prevent the late phase reaction. Okay? You take the rescue inhaler, it makes you feel good right now, it keeps your lungs open for about six hours. The late phase reaction is still happening, but your lungs are dilated enough at that time that despite the fact that late phase is occurring, there's more mucus production, there are more inflammatory cells, you're not symptomatic because you've dilated your lungs enough that you're not feeling it. And then over time, that late phase reaction settles down unless you're continually being exposed to that allergen or whatever the inciting agent is, a virus, a bacteria, or, or whatever caused the inflammation to begin with. And so then it keeps building up. You have to use your rescue inhaler again. Use it on Monday, now use it again on Thursday. And that late phase reaction keeps happening, and now use it again on Saturday. And before you know it, you're doing it on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, and now you're doing it three times on Wednesday because the inflammation is, is continuing to build until you can figure out a way to stop it. Okay. When you take the ICS, you are decreasing that late phase reaction significantly. You're decreasing that baseline inflammation significantly. In fact, it may go away. You may have normal appearing lungs like, like that one picture showed if you're on that ICS for a long enough period of time. Okay. So then you get the virus, it hits your nose, and it doesn't cause as much of a reaction because that inflammation is much, much lessened than it was before. It's kind of like when you skin your arm when you fall down and you pour salt on it, it hurts like crazy. But if you put salt on your skin when it's not skin, it doesn't hurt at all. And so the same thing, you're trying to heal the lungs with the ICS so that when that insult comes around, it's not such a big deal. Okay. All right, do we have maybe one more question or are people they're they're ready for it's almost happy All hour, right. isn't it? It is happy. Yes. It's five o'clock on Let's a Friday. once again thank Dr. Josie for doing a great presentation. I'm gonna go through some slides of Jacksonville since yep. you're here. I was born and raised in Jacksonville, so I love it here, so I'm gonna brag about my city. You guys are in a very good location where you can see the sunset tonight, hopefully. Um, and it sunsets over the river and we get some amazing pictures when there are clouds in the sky. We typically only get this in the summer because we have more clouds with the humidity in the evening hours. And you'll be able to see this. This picture was taken just a little bit away from where you're sitting right now. Um, please get a chance to go to the beach at some point. Um, it's one of the things that makes Northeast Florida unique from the rest of the state. There are no cars allowed on the beach here, so you can walk and not worry about it. Um, it's a great place for pets and things like that, and we have a beautiful ocean, very clean beach. Uh, everything natural there when you go down. Um, you can see a great sunrise if you get there by 6.30 in the morning tomorrow. Um, my kids blowing bubbles out there as well, um, and so that with the sunrise is also uh, fun to see. And, um, and hopefully at some point you'll be seeing the Jaguars in the Super Bowl. So that's, that was the sun rising on draft day this year, in fact. Um, and we have, we're the only stadium in the NFL that has pools. And so that's a picture from our pool in the stadium. Um, and there's an, this is a sunrise in downtown Jacksonville looking towards the beach. We have seven bridges in downtown. And this was a sunset just a couple of weeks ago. Okay. So you're at a good place here. You should try to enjoy it. I know you're learning a lot about asthma. It's very controversial, but the rest of it's good too. Okay, thank you.